go ahead and open up a sermon in prayer. Dear Lord, uh, let it be your words and not mine that are spoken today. And Lord, uh, whatever message uh, you have to give, uh, if anything I say contradicts that, let it fall on deaf ears. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So what happens when we live our lives with conviction? What does it mean to be misunderstood? These are questions I often ask myself when I read lives about incredible people. You know, the people who made the most impact in the world are people who didn't start off being understood. When I read Paul's story, I often think about that. In the fourth century, there was a theologian, there was a theologian named Nestorius who divided the church into two factions. Uh, one called themselves the Oriental Orthodox Church, and the other called them the Eastern Orthodox Church. More than a thousand years later, every time I talk with Orthodox Christians, capital L, um, they tell me, yeah, we do not know why we split. So conflict was there just waiting to happen, and they gave in to it. John Perkins in a class said something that will always stick with me. Humans will always find reasons to hate each other. Our job as Christians is to break that. And the reason why for that is so important. We can find that in this passage. So let's go ahead and turn to Acts 24, 1-23. I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. Five days later, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a lawyer named Trichilus, and they pressed charges against Paul before the governor. And after the governor summoned Paul, Trichilus began to make the case against him. He declared, under your leadership, we have experienced substantial peace, and your administration has brought reforms to our nation. Always and everywhere, most honorable Felix, we acknowledge this with deep gratitude. I don't want to take too much of your time, so I ask that you listen with your usual courtesy to our brief statement of the facts. We have found this man to be a troublemaker who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the empire. He's a ringleader of the Nazarene faction and even tried to defile the temple. That's when we arrested him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to verify the allegations we are bringing against him. And the Jews reinforce the action against Paul, affirming the truth of these accusations. And then the governor nodded at Paul, giving him permission to speak. And he responded, I know you have been judged over this nation for many years, so I gladly offer my own defense. You can verify that I went to worship in Jerusalem more than 12, no more than 12 days ago. They didn't find me arguing with anyone in the temple or stirring up a crowd, whether in the synagogue or anywhere else in the city. Nor can they prove to you the allegations they are now bringing against me. I do admit this, though, that I am a follower of the way, which they call a faction. And accordingly, I worship the God of our ancestors and believe everything set out in the law and written in the prophets. The hope I have in God I also share with my accusers that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and unrighteous. On account of this, I have committed myself to maintaining a clear conscience before God and with all people. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring gifts for the poor of any nation and to offer sacrifices. That's actually says my nation, but all right. So when they found me in the temple, I was ritually pure. There was no crowd and no disturbance. But there were some Jews from the province of Asia. They shouldn't be here making their accusations if indeed they have something against me. In their absence have these people who are here declare what crime they found when I stood before the Jerusalem council. And perhaps it concerns me this one statement that I blurted out when I was with them. 
I am on trial before you today because of the resurrection of the dead. Felix read an accurate understanding of the way, adjourned the meeting, and he said, When Lysias the commander arrives from Jerusalem, I will decide this case. And he arranged for a centurion to guard Paul. He was to give Paul some freedom, and his friends were not hindered in their efforts to provide for him. So at the conclusion of this chapter, we see that Paul actually stayed in prison for two years, despite Felix finding no fault with him. And all because Jewish leaders perceived him to be this massive threat. Paul was being a good observant Jew. Uh, when the early church began, it was normal to see Christians attending synagogue services. Uh, it wasn't a contradiction because they saw it as a form of faith they were already a part of. So completely a cultural thing. So whenever people tell me we need to return to the first century church, I ask them, should we convert to Judaism first? Um, anyway, I think that's a good joke. But anyway, the main point of this is that Paul really wasn't doing anything wrong in hindsight. Uh, I mentioned in the last sermon how there were a variety of views of the afterlife with the Jews. This was just someone who stood by his convictions and preached what was in his heart. So the response, of course, is to throw him into prison and throw away the key. One of my professors uh, was teaching at a Bible college out in Minnesota, and we tried to be as vague as possible here. But um, one day he was called by another prominent pastor uh, in the area I asked to meet him for lunch. Uh, when they sat down, the pastor said to my professor, you are the number one threat to everything I believe. So I'm going to pursue getting you fired and your church revoked from your denomination. So my professor was flabbergasted. He had only met this man two times before, and yet here he was gathering all the other area pastors against him. So he was let go from the Bible college due to the pressure of the area ministries, even though they all told him they had never read a word of my professors, but they believed this one pastor. Um, so he still teaches adjunctly, but he's not officially hired in there anymore. So when I heard him tell this story, he said, the most important thing I knew is I needed to respond with love to this man who had nothing but destruction on he may have taken away a lot from me, but when I look at where I'm at now, I'm almost glad he did it. I don't know if I could reply with that, but I think the key thing that helps him sleep at night is that he knows he followed his conscience and he didn't back down. And that is the key to conviction. Choosing to sleep at night over feeling regret later down the road. Paul could have taken the easy way out. He could have stayed silent in the synagogues. He could have apologized for perhaps making such a scene where people got emotional. He could have taken the safe way. But he chose integrity. He chose to follow his conscience. There's a story about the Quaker John Woolman. Uh, he writes in his journal, how he hated himself for not being more blunt and honest. He was a really, really shy guy in his mid-twenties when his ministry began. So uh, he lived during a time in the 1700s where, of course, slavery was normal. And one day someone came in with a slave and asked him to write a bill of receipt for him. And a woman finally decided to take a stand and talk with the man instead about the evils of slavery. And the man ended up uh, with his uh, mind changed and his convictions changed. And the woman talked to him compassionately and understandingly. This was a profound experience for a woman because he realized he didn't need to be really aggressive to have a good conscience. He just needed to be faithful. In a class I took on community development, we studied the history of the slave trade and how the Quakers and Mennonites were actually pretty much the only ones uh, that worked against the bad theology of the 
It was common belief that God made America the new Israel. So therefore, anything they did to claim land, or anything they did to conquer others, was justified. One messed up quote that I read said that God delights in the massacre of native children. This was the norm. That was the dominant belief. So what's so interesting to me is how John Woolman's testimony and how the testimony of those fraction or Christians on the edges or on the margins were able to speak into the condition of those churches. One text I read credited Woolman with being the dominant figure in abolitionism in the early colonies, going as far as to force Thomas Jefferson to re-examine his own view. The early friends felt it was their Christian duty to live in integrity and conviction and to not take the easy way out. They believed that since everyone was made in the image of God, or in their language happy and delight, that everyone needs to be treated with empathy and love. You can't take the image of God out when you read the stories about Jesus and how he interacts with people. We know history has a way of moving forward. And for the Jewish leaders at the time, they were absolutely convinced that Paul's message was going to go nowhere. And this is because they had successfully crushed several other movements that came out of Jewish faith. This is the way they dealt with people. So Paul ended up being the thorn in their side because his message never lost traction. Because as historians would later on point out, Christianity was the first religion to really speak to the marginalized. It was the first religion where people could see themselves being valued by God. And because of faith and courage of people like Paul, we are in church today. So when we live with conviction, it makes our message so much more meaningful and impactful. When we live with compassion, it makes our message so much more tangible. Now, Paul could have totally had every reason to, you know, cuss out the rulers, to cuss out everyone around him. But instead, he was calm and peaceful and stood with his convictions. He stood his ground. I find that it is always easy to be temporarily uncomfortable than to live with regret. But that's a choice we all need to make. Jesus and Paul give us a way to live faithfully and with conviction. And I think they're better, their way is a lot better than what I want to do. We live in a culture that thrives on conflict, thrives on hatred. We need to be that voice that's a gentle conscience of the church, honest, but convicting, and to not give in to these antagonists. Because tomorrow history will move forward. And the last thing we want to be remembered for is to, not be, is to be a product of the same kind of hatred that the world has. It always comes back out of winter when we talk to the world. And I'm someone that doesn't necessarily like conflict. Um, I don't think anyone does. But um, I just do not enjoy this feeling of being a perpetual conflict with people. It doesn't happen often, but... I think that's how I know I was called to be a peacemaker. I'm actually taking a class on peacemaking now, but it's so interesting to me. Is that at least a third of my class are Kenyans uh, zooming in from the slums of Nairobi. They are pastors who want to resolve the conflict they see, which is uh, between the government and the people, but also between tribes. So every time I want to have conflict with someone or think something's unsolvable now, I think of Kenyans who get up at 2 a.m. in the morning just to take a class on peacemaking. And I remember that they are actively working for reconciliation, and I can work for that too. I am called to do that because that is the way of Jesus. Our culture would say that it's okay to have this conflict here, to further keep dividing us, to further keep finding reasons for us to continue hating each other. But the way of Jesus invites us into a better way.
So let's then uh, give in to the way of love. Let's get in, give in to the way of conviction. We don't need to be in everyone's faces to do the right thing. We just need to be present and willing to talk honestly. If it wasn't for what John Woolman did in his own way, where he faced several backlashes for what he did, but he always responded with love, the abolitionist movement would have had a much harder time taking off. And his way was full of quiet integrity. The way Jesus calls us to live in this world is not going to be easy. But it will help us sleep better at night knowing we are doing the right thing. And I'm sure when Paul got to prison, he went to sleep knowing he was faithful true to his own convictions. So what can we say about ourselves today? And how can we live in conviction and compassion? One of my favorite books, and it was the last book he ever wrote, uh, Where Do We Go From Here? by Martin Luther King. Uh, he wrote a very famous quote that's used often. And he wrote, Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. As a Christian, I think being misunderstood comes into the territory. If we're doing it right. Being misunderstood, though, is given, better than giving in to the hatred and violence around us. And I'm sure people thought Woolman was a little goofy. In fact, I am 100% positive they were. Because he went as far as to refuse to buy anything that was made by slaves. So he had a much harder way of going about things. But he was able to sleep at night. Jesus says to us every morning, my mercies are now. So we have a chance to make things right and to live honestly. And the thing about grace is that it accepts us as we are, but that it also grows us into the people God needs us to be in whatever moment we find ourselves in. And at the end of the day, I think that's a huge blessing and a great invitation to an adventure. Let's go ahead and sing in our hearts uh, the shield about me and then lead into open worship. I'll go ahead and close in prayer. Dear Lord, uh, we thank you for the time you've been given. Uh, I pray, Lord, you give us this conviction and compassion to do the right thing, to be peacemakers in our culture around us. Lord, let us not be people who stand by, but people of action and people of courage. And let our testimonies reflect that. In Jesus' name, amen.